Hey y'all, welcome to the Messy Studio. Come on in and see what's going on. It's been a fairly productive week around here in the Messy Studio. Finished my air filtration unit. I've got it up and running. Well, it's up and it's running. As you can tell, it's relatively quiet. And it works. Cool, huh? How's the noise? I think it's okay. That said, it's time for another episode of Turn Talk. And what's my topic for the day? Turning jigs and, I don't know, let's call them tricks and tips, maybe. I don't know. Mainly turning jigs. Uh, some of them you've already seen in progress. Some of them you may not have seen the videos where I'm using them. So... Come along with me and let me show you the things that I have come up with to make turning a little bit easier for me. In one of my more recent videos, you've seen my homemade donut chuck. Now, it won't take a bowl bigger than much, much bigger than, well, about nine inches is the max. But I built it specifically for one project that I ha just, I didn't have any other way of turning it around. I didn't want to use the jam chuck. It, did, it, it wasn't working well enough to my satisfaction. And I've, I've seen donut chucks in use. I made this one out of Corian. I put, I used a, a grease pencil and marked rings ever half inch so that it helps me get the bowl centered on here. And then I'll make sure I get it centered using the tailstock. And then I can tighten it down. I lined it with white closed cell foam. Believe it or not, it came out of a packing crate. What's the backside look like, Billy? Well, I'm glad you asked. Asked it, 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 it. One of the things I'm going to be showing are these little deals right here. I made my own faceplate. Yeah, I could have used a commercial faceplate, but years back, I bought a tool that has become almost indispensable, and that's this little here spindle tap. This is a beel. This is a beel spindle tap. The beel tap is one and a quarter by eight because that matches the spindle on my lathe. And I can make my own face plates with it. Speaking of face plates, I've made several. This one, it's a combination face plate slash glue block. This is a tapped jam chuck that I made for another project. A lot of people don't like to spend the kind of money that it costs uh, for that beel spindle tap. Uh, I think I paid, they're only, I think they're $30, $35 now. If I remember correctly, I gave about $25 for it. And I don't know if I can find a commercial faceplate for less than $20, $25. So I can make a bunch of them up. And with these, I just use some good quality plywood on the back because that's where there's not much thread in, in the plywood because I want it to be tight to the shoulder of, of the spindle so that I get a good connection, which is with the way that our face plates and our chucks are milled so that they seat tight on the shoulder of the spindle. Well, I do the same thing with the shoulder of my homemade face plates. I don't have threads in the back so that I can get a good seat up against the shoulder. And it's bigger in diameter because it has to match. That's the way I make them. They work great. $25 I spent versus I've got one, two, three, four. I've made about eight of them or 10 or 12, I don't know. And you start adding that cost up if I had purchased uh, eight or 10 or 12 commercial face plates, that's at $20 or more a pop. That, I can't afford that. And many of you can't either. And one day I wanted a 12 inch disc sander. Well, I didn't have a 12 inch disc sander and I couldn't afford one. A friend of mine took me to a flea market where he said they always had a lot of tools and stuff. And what I found was a 12 inch aluminum disc off of a disc sander, just the disc. Along with the disc, it had the arbor mechanism. It was a piece of steel riveted onto this aluminum plate and I drilled the rivets out because it didn't fit anything I had and I turned me one of my face plates and 
screwed it up and put this on. Now I have a 12 inch disc sander. You know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. Well, I had a need. I wanted one of these. It wasn't a terrible need, but I wanted one of these. And it's come in really handy. I now have a commercial tap that's three quarter ten, commercial flat bottom tap to match the threads on my live center. Back before I bought that tap, I bought a stainless steel three quarter ten bolt and I put it in my vise and I took my angle grinder and I cut three channels out of that bolt and I made my own tap for my this. Now I use the commercial one. This one still works fine. It needs a little fine tuning, but I was in a hurry and that worked in a pinch. So you can pick one of these up. That tap I think I got off Amazon for, I don't know, $16, $18. This I bought at Lowe's for two and a half. <laughs> I already had my angle grinder. You can make your own dies out of any size you want, either using an angle grinder or a Dremel and, and cutting a bolt. Start with a good quality bolt. I like using stainless steel. It stays sharp longer. So why do I need something like that? I use this when I'm doing segments, segmented turning. If you've, you've seen me use it, if you've watched any of my segmented turning videos. If you haven't, they're in a playlist. So I'll put a link to that playlist up here. How do I use this? I'll take my segmented rings and I, I again, I mark this every half inch and I mount it to my lathe. Wait a minute, Billy. Your spindle's one and a quarter. This is 13 inches. So this won't fit on any lathe except this one. It won't fit on Manova because it's limited at 12. It's not three quarter 10 anyway. So anyway, I, I mounted it on the lathe and I cut these grooves every half inch. That lets me center the rings on this plate and I hot glue them in place. I make sure they're nice and flat, run them through my sander, or I can just put them on here and true them up but I'll hot glue them on and glue them to whatever's on my glue block up here against the lay. So how do I do that? There's a hole in this live center. I, took a, I cut me a nail and I cut it the same length as the barrel on my live center. Now if I need to use this to thread onto, and then you know, I remember I said I tapped this to fit. If, if I need to use this to thread this on, I need to hold that stopped. How do I hold it stopped? I put the nail through it. Now, I could use the tool that came with it for doing that. It's also the knockout tool that knocks that button out of the end, but that little nail works just fine, and it gets it up there. And I've got a couple of these face plates this size too. So if I need to put something that's three quarter 10 on my spindle and turn it, I'll put this nail in it, I'll wrap some tape around it, and then in here it goes and I can turn. So that's how I turn this round and put the grooves in it. Something else that I've used this for is when I got this on here, I'll take it to my workbench and I'll have a piece sitting on it and I can stand this up inside of one of my chucks upside down and it just fits. And then I've got me a homemade Lazy Susan that I can work on and do stuff on and turn my, my project around if I'm spraying it or whatever. And this is Formica covered, lemon covered plywood, Formica basically that uh, came from an old cabinet that I took out of my house when I lived in Ohio after I, when I remodeled the bathrooms. Uh, all of the cabinets were made of this stuff. I kept every piece of it. You've seen me use it on my workbench and what I, I'll do all my gluing on it because it just scrapes right off. Something else that I'll do so that I'm not constantly having to drive screws into, when I'm using a face plate, driving screws into the blank or whatever, I made, I took this piece of oak and it's inch and a half, I guess, and mounted it to the face plate, trued it up, especially the front, and then I'll glue my piece onto that face plate and then I can turn it from there. And I can use this over and over again because I'll just come in and cut that piece off and 
got another glue block to use. I've got four or five of these. If you've seen any of my pin turning videos, you'll notice that I do all my turning of pins between centers. How do I do that? Well, I've got a 60 degree live center, 60 degree dead center. That goes in the headstock. Live center, of course, goes in the tailstock. Well, Billy, don't you have to have special bushings for that? Uh, for the slim lines and stuff? Yes. But for almost anything else, no. This is, this is a bushing for a Berea Baron. And if you look at the end of that bushing, I don't know if it's focusing on that or not. That's cut to 60 degrees inside so that it sits nicely up against either my live center or my dead center. It didn't come that way. This isn't the one I used. This one's a little small, but I, I bought a set of these center drills. I've got three different diameters. Center drills are what machinists use to start holes that they need to be very, very accurate. It starts with a small pilot hole and then starts cutting with a little bit bigger hole and then they can ramp up the size from there. Uh, I use them a lot for the same thing in wood. It gives me a very nice start when I'm, because I do all my drilling of pin blanks on the lathe. I'll chuck this up. I always get a nice, I don't get the wobble from a twist drill. This is dead center. I get a dead center hole right through the blank every single time. But I also use it because these are made for cutting metal. I use the bigger one and I drill these out to 60 degrees. Okay, how do you hold that? These days, I hold them with my Beal collet chuck. I'll find a collet that's closest to this diameter. I'll put it in, I'll tighten it up, and then drill it out using a center drill. How did I do it before I had one of these? Because these are not cheap. These collet mandrels aren't terribly expensive, the Beals. Uh, sometimes they come with collets, sometimes they didn't. I bought mine without them because I bought a full set of 16 collets off of eBay for, I think, $80 back then because I wanted a wide range. Before then, what I did was I actually made a wooden collet uh, the same way I made wooden collets for doing my uh, shell casing and antler pins. I make a, wood co I mean, a wooden collet that I can hold in my scroll jaw chuck, my four jaw chuck. Basically all you have to do, look at any collet, whether it be the ER32 collets from the Beal collet chuck or the collet from your router. Look at any collet and see how it's constructed. You can make the same thing out of wood. Uh, you don't want to use a hard wood. You don't want to use a brittle wood. You don't want it to be too soft either, but pine usually works fine. Fir, cypress, <clears throat> Cedar's too brittle and use it so if you're good because you're gonna have to have a hole through it so use it spindle direction don't use it cross grain because y your grain needs to flex more than that cross grain structure is going to let you have it, it'll have a tendency to shatter but you can make your own collets that you can tighten up on on your on your chucks so that's one way of doing it I made these, gosh, 15 years ago. What for, Billy? Well, if you've seen any of Captain Eddie's videos, you know he does, he uses what he calls a soft touch. He'll turn these out of wood and put it on the live center. This one used to be threaded, it's been stripped, but it holds just fine. Put it on your live center so you can put it up against the wood and it doesn't, it won't hurt the bowl that you're turning. And if you cut into this when you're flattening the bottom of the bowl, you don't have to worry about cutting into metal. You can just flatten the bottom of the bowl and when you get through, you're done. This was another one I made. It wasn't made for this live center. It was made for the live center that came with my Delta. It just slips right over it like a cat and I've got a soft touch. Because of the way this is made, you just drill this out with a Forstner bit, chug it up, make it round, turn it around, cut your hole, with your Forstner bit, turn it back around, finish shaping it up because you're holding this in your chuck. And when you're done, it just slips right on if the size is right. More of the same, except this one, same thing, fits on here. 
and it's cupped. I did this for two things. I did it for turning uh, eggs. You can do them for spheres. I haven't turned that many spheres. I haven't, I've, I haven't turned any spheres in a long time. I turned a few years ago. Uh, they weren't that great. <laughs> but uh, you can use, you can do something like this for spheres. I did it for, well, I made this particular one for a very special project that I just can't really discuss. And here's another one. You can do almost anything with these things. You've got wood. Make stuff. If you're like me, you have more wood than you have money. So you can always find a way to make something that's going to get the job done. Got a comment the other day on, on a couple of my tool rests. Of course, I've got 12-inch rests that came with my Powermatic. And I've got these two. I had these made by a guy that welds a whole lot better than me. And when I got them, it was just the one inch bar stock welded to this angle iron. He said I was, I'd was i have to add my own uh, support in here. He did drill them out for me. I could have done that, but, so I took some oak, cut it at 45, I took I think it was a three-quarter inch piece of oak, cut it in half at a 45, put them in here, screwed them in. I think there may be some glue in there too. And they're nice little tool rests. I've got the materials to make uh, my own. I'll have somebody do the finish weld and I'll get them tacked where I want them. You'll see those one of these days, I hope. I got an idea. I don't know if it's gonna work. We're gonna find out. I built this sled for my bandsaw for cutting pin blanks. You can see I've got marks on it for various things. Got a runner in the bottom that uh, matches my miter slot. This has been chewed up some over the years. I didn't use thick enough plywood. I was trying to say, well, this is just what I had. I probably should have gone with quarter instead of eighth inch. You can see it's got a little warp on it, but for cutting pin blanks, it works just fine. Uh, I put uh, a T-track in the top for using, I've got a stop lock that I made and I'll use that sometimes. I'm so cheap, sometimes it scares me. <laughs> uh, you can see this has a special shaped runner on it. This is made specifically for my Craftsman table saw. Uh, they have those funny tracks for the miter gauges. You see it's 45 degree here. This is where the saw blade runs. I can move this along this T-track this way and I'll put my my blank that I'm cutting up here. This is one of the jigs that I made for for doing my special inlays on pin blanks. Uh, I even I made my own hold down. I had a piece of uh, aluminum C channel. I didn't I couldn't afford to, those fancy hold downs that you can buy. And I had some aluminum C channel and I had wood. So I have to cut a piece of wood to fit in the middle of this C-channel, cut it to shape. You can see where the wood comes through on the inside. So I, I cut it to shape, put a hole in it, toilet bolt. I did buy a batch of these handles off of somebody. And I put sandpaper on the rounded ends. And it makes a good little clamp. And you just crank it down and that holds your pin blank in place and keeps your fingers clear of the table saw blade. I had this one sander that I was constantly having to use it when I'm power sanding a bowl, changing grits, taking it off and on. And, and if you're not using the best quality sandpaper, which I admit sometimes I haven't, you've heard me cuss cheap sandpaper on a few videos. You do that a couple of times and before the sandpaper's worn out, the Velcro backing or the, the hook part of the back, I mean the loop part of the backing on the sandpaper starts coming off. That or over time, you'll start ripping the, the hooks off of this foam. And I didn't want to spend the money that it would cost for six of these for the grits that I use. So I made my own. Well, how do you do that? I had some quarter inch bolts, fine thread, that I will probably never ever use. And I have wood. So I cut me a piece of wood. I drilled a hole in it, drove the head of that quarter inch bolt down into that bigger hole that I made with my, it was just undersized that I made with a Forstner bit. And then I epoxied it in place. And then, and this is where it gets, well, 
Some people call me the repurposer. <clears throat> this white and gray rubber stuff, it's a sole from an old tennis shoe. <laughs> yeah, it was completely flat on one side. This side was where the, uh, hit the, where it hit the ground. So the inside was flat. So I used some adhesive and I stuck the rubber to the wood and then I chucked this up in my drill chuck, put it in my headstock, turned this to the shape that I wanted and the diameter that I wanted. And then I tried cutting this flat with, uh, with a skew. You're not gonna do it with a chisel at all. So I tried cutting it flat with a skew. That almost worked, but it wasn't good enough. So I got it roughly to the shape I wanted with a skew. And I've got a, an old piece of oak here. It's nice and straight and flat that I simply glued some 80 or 100 grit sandpaper to. And then I held that up and, and it sanded it flat. So once I got it sanded flat, I glued my piece of Velcro to it, the hook side, and I made about eight of them. They work great. So if you can't afford to buy a set of those, like I couldn't, make your own. It's not that hard and it doesn't cost that much. Oh, the Velcro, where'd I get that? Uh, I bought some two by three inch, is it two by three or two by four? Uh, orange Velcro strips off of eBay, a whole package of them for like $10 shipped. I've got other jigs and things that I've made that I don't really use for, for turning. And I haven't showed those. I tried to stick with a turning theme because it's a turn talk. But you've seen most of the things that I've come up with to help me along the way in my turning journey. So I hope this has been beneficial for you. I appreciate you watching, folks. I really, really do. I've got this small piece of, I don't know what it is. I, I, at first, I thought it might be maple, but when I was cutting it round, it don't smell like maple. Uh, the, the side grain, it's kind of reminiscent of cherry, but it don't look like cherry either. I don't know what it is, but it's small, and it came off of a pallet, American pallet, so I don't have to worry. I, I looked at all the marks on the pallet, and there's nothing bad in it. So I'm going to make me a little, I don't know if it's going to be a pot, a box, or a bowl. Don't know what it's going to be yet, but I'm going to make something out of it. So come back and see how that comes along. I appreciate it, folks. Once again, thank you so much. Y'all come back.